Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Andy. Um, I'm part of the, um, the preaching team here at Regionally Community Church. Um, as you probably know already, you know, we, um, we do have uh, a range of speakers uh, here at Regionally Community Church. Um, you get to hear um, a different kind of variety of, of, of styles um, for our messages on Sunday, and you get a variety of faces. Um, so yeah, it's actually quite unusual. Um, we had a double dose of uh, Richard Miller in the last couple of weeks. Um, so this is a third in our series um, looking at sacrifice, uh, living a sacrificial lifestyle. So we had the introduction from Richard uh, on that uh, series. And then last week we had Richard back again uh, to talk about sacrifice being a heart issue. And... Um, for me, my preach uh, this week is it, very much linked to that um, sacrifice being a heart issue. Um, for me, it kind of takes that, that concept and then brings it um, to its kind of um, logical uh, next step. Um, so my topic today is that sacrifice is an everyday occurrence, or occurrence, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Uh, that's where I'll be um, looking as a kind of a, the core text uh, for kind of unpacking this topic. Um, so, say, so yeah, we, we had um, a couple of chapters um, last week. We just got a couple of verses uh, this week. Um, but, uh, you know, as you know from studying the Bible, you know, we don't need a lot to, to, to get a lot out of it um, with lots of, of different um, aspects and details to look at. So uh, let's have a look um, at the text then for today, which is uh, entitled, A Living Sacrifice. Uh, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, as we know, this is um, a letter written by Paul to the church in Rome. Um, and, you know, Rome um, now, uh, and certainly um, when this was written a, a long, long time ago, that the same thing is kind of true. Um, it is a very multicultural place. You've got people that have kind of come from, from all over different countries that have now settled uh, in Rome and, you know, are, are then, you know, become a, a Roman citizen. Um, so Paul is basically, he's kind of getting in there and he wants to sort out some of the issues that are going on, some of the arguments, some of the kind of discussions that are going on because, of course, all these people are, are new Christians. Um, they're either Jewish, so they, yeah, they, kind of, they, they, they kind of grew up in the kind of Jewish traditions. Now Jesus has come through, and they've gone, right, yeah, recognize that. Um, okay, well, now I'm, I'm kind of something different. Or you were a Gentile, which basically means everyone else. So you don't have that, that tradition, you don't have that kind of lineage of of being um, part of the people of God. You're kind of coming to this fresh. Um, and now you've got this, this kind of mix of people. Um, and understandably, you know, there are going to be some um, different points of view, shall we say. So I think Paul is kind of getting in there and he is um, sorting some of this stuff out. Um, and when we get to, to this verse here in chapter 12, um, Paul is, is saying that he appeals to you, therefore. So yeah, it, it, it's almost like Paul is, is, kind, of, is kind of begging us, uh, begging the, the church in Rome, you know, please listen to this. This is important. Um, and if it's important to them, important to us. Um, and he says the word therefore, and uh, you know, I think you know, various um, sort of commentators are always sort of uh, asking us to, to look at well, what's the therefore, therefore? Um, what is its purpose? And its purpose is, is looking back over what Paul has already said. Obviously, we're at chapter 12, uh, so we've got 11 chapters 
that have already kind of gone before. So uh, in my preparation, uh, and uh, maybe in yours as well, um, I asked you to kind of look back um, at some of the, those bits in, in Romans so we kind of get an understanding of, of what Paul has already sort of laid out so that he can then say what he says in chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. So um, what I've done here is I've taken the um, kind of subheadings um, found from, on the, uh, the kind of ESV uh, version and I've just listed them out. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but yet they're, they're on the screen uh, for you to, to have a look at. Um, but yeah, straight from the off, uh, chapter 1, we have some greetings, normal. Uh, and then we have the righteous shall live by faith. So Paul is kind of setting it out uh, right from the start there. Um, in chapter 3, um, it says no one is righteous. And what, what that kind of means is you know, no one is righteous um, by birth. Uh, no one is righteous just because they are a Jew. You know, we've all sinned, Jew and Gentile. The righteousness of God is through faith. Um, we are justified by his grace as a gift through Jesus, and this is received by faith. This is, this is the gospel message. Um, and then Paul kind of gives an example here of Abraham, um, again, sort of appealing to um, the Jews, kind of, you, know, you know, you know Abraham, right? Great guy, wasn't he? Did loads of great things, um, obeyed the law, did some great works, but he essentially was just like everyone else. He was justified through his faith, and also, you know, Abraham had a promise, didn't he, about his descendants, and that promise was realised through faith. It wasn't realised by uh, Abraham following the law or by his own um, kind of efforts. And uh, same in, in chapter 5, we're kind of looking at uh, another kind of example uh, of, of Adam and Jesus and kind of taking care. Okay, we've, got, we've got two, two men here, um, both obviously very important in, in their own right. Uh, with, with Adam, we have the, uh, the, the birth of sin into the world, so... You know, it's from that kind of descendants of Adam that we've all sinned. And then Jesus is kind of one again, one man. So it's Adam's disobedience that kind of causes the, uh, the problem in the first place. And it's Jesus' obedience which puts it all back right again. Um, then moving on, um, uh, Paul gives some, some, some really great um, sort of comments here, doesn't he? Um, so, for example... Uh, in chapter six, it says, "You know, what should we say then? Are we to, to uh, are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means," he says. "You know, we have died to Christ, so we're free to walk in newness of life. Um, well, we're not under law anymore, so well, shall we sin because we're not under law? But we'll be by grace. By no means." And in fact, um, Paul uses this phrase, slaves to righteousness. And uh, yeah, I think when we read that, we go, ooh, slaves? Slaves? But I mean, obviously righteousness is good, but are we slaves? And yeah, Paul's point is, you know, we are tied to God. That, that's kind of who we are. You know, that, that's, that's why we're, we're slaves to righteousness, because we are tied to God. Um, chapter 7, being released from the law. Um, I guess you know, the Jews would have been very, um, very difficult for them to, to kind of put, put this down. This was something that was so important to them, something that had been passed down through generations to generations. And Paul gives this example about marriage. You know, he says, yeah, marriage is good. You know, marriage is, 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 is there, it, it's permanent. But if, if, one, if a spouse dies, then, then you're released from that marriage. So he's giving that example of where, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it, it, it can come to an end. And, you know, this is, this is the time for it. Um, chapter 10, message of salvation to all. You know, everyone who believes in him shall not be put to shame. So, so Paul is, is getting in there and he is looking at, you know, how is righteousness received? By works or by grace? What happens to the law now that Jesus is here? What about the Gentiles? You know, they, they never had the law in, in the first place. 
Um, are they under the law too? Um, you know, Jews have enjoyed this kind of being being God's special people. Well, are they still God's special people? What, what, what's going on there? So Paul, in a nutshell, is saying that all have sinned, and if we believe in Jesus, then we are redeemed. So that, that's a therefore. That's you know, what Paul has already been talking about. So from that, we can then sort of... It's like we're, we're at the start of our, our journey. Um, you know, so, so, so now what? Now what are we doing? It says, by the mercies of God. So again, the mercies of God is, is, is kind of what, what's already gone before. It is the gospel. It's been purchased by blood, 1 Corinthians 6. So we, we enjoy the righteousness of God. We are children of God. And then we come uh, to this next bit. Um, you know, this is what we are to do. You know, this is the instruction, if you like, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And obviously, yeah, this this um, this phrase contains the word sacrifice. You know, which again is, is what we're we're talking about in this um, in this series. Uh, living a sacrificial lifestyle. Um, so sacrifice then, so it, it, it means that you know, we don't have it anymore. You know, we've transferred ownership um, from ourselves. So we've, we've given it to God. It's in God's hands. It's now for a higher purpose, uh, to be magnified. It's a choice. You know, we're not forced to do this. You know, God longs for us to choose him rather than our own desires. You know, sacrifice for me, and uh, when we discussed this as a, as a, as a preaching team, you know, the, the same kind of general consensus came through, that sacrifice you know, tends to have a kind of a, a negative um, emotion with us, a negative connotation to sacrifice. Because you know, our, our fleshy desires, you know, w- w- we love stuff. And so if we're having to sacrifice stuff, if we're, if we're giving stuff up, then that's bad, isn't it? And so we, we kind of think of it as being negative, but... You know, we know, and we need to continually remind ourselves and remind uh, each other that, you know, it's not quite really like this at all. Maybe it would be helpful to think about it uh, in this way. Uh, when we sacrifice something, it is a bit like planting a seed and then walking away. You know, we, we, we've got ownership of our, of our seed or our bulb or our little sapling, and we, we're planting it and we're walking away. And then it's in God's service. It's in God's hands. It's going to grow. It's going to mature. Um, and then it's going to be helpful. It's going to be of benefit. It's going to be beneficial to God. You know, it's going to give glory to God. Uh, it could be beneficial to other people you know, in, a, in a spiritual sense or in a practical sense. And often, sacrifice is actually beneficial to us. You know, we, can either, we, can, we can learn something. Um, God can teach us through our sacrifice. And yeah, how often um, have you found it where you've, you've sacrificed something and, and God's kind of either given you the same thing back again, but in, in greater quantity, or you know, God's actually given you something, something else, something better. He, he's, he's kind of replaced it in your own life. So you know, sacrifice is, is something that um, you know, it, it, we can look upon as being positive, a real blessing. I don't know about you, but when I was younger, when I read about the, the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, I, I suppose I didn't really get it. And um, I kind of thought, oh, what a waste, eh? What a, what a waste of food. I mean, it's just it's burning. It's, just, it's, not, it's not going anywhere. But you know, giving glory to God is never wasteful. You know, strengthening, our, strengthening our relationship with God is never wasteful. And being obedient to God is never wasteful. So then, a, a living sacrifice. You know, this is, um, it's amazing, isn't it, that um, you know, we have this resource, um, the Bible, and um, yeah, they, these kind of terms that, that we, you know, just, just two words, living sacrifice, but it's something that, you know, is, is, is yeah, really kind of mind-blowing in terms of, you know, what does that actually mean and we can keep digging into it um, and, uh, and, and drawing more things out of it. 
And I think you know, Paul had, had chosen this to kind of appeal to the, the Jews and, and to the Gentiles. So, you know, a living sacrifice. Obviously, the Jews knew all about sacrifices. They knew what it meant um, to, to kind of physically see uh, that consequence of your sin, um, to, to see it, to feel it, and, and to smell it as well. Uh, for the Gentiles, this was, you know, you kind of say, well, it, you know, it, it, it's like that, the concept of, uh, of sacrifice, of animal sacrificing and, and that sort of thing is, the, the principle is good, but we're now talking about living sacrifices. You know, we need to show that we're grateful for what God has done in our lives. Um, we put him at the center of our lives and we trust him. Um, it's our bodies that we're sacrificing, but it's a living sacrifice. So, what's with the goats? <laughs> well, um, for, for me, it, it's, it's just an encouragement, really, to, to think about, you know, when, when you take food to a goat, the, the goat is not bothered who you are. The goat is not bothered about your standing in life. Uh, it's not bothered about whether you're white or black. It doesn't care about your background. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it'll just very, very happily accept uh, your, your offering of food. And, and so what I'm saying is, you know, we need to be confident. You know, God is like this. You know, God, it doesn't matter who we are. But, you know, if we come to God with that, that sacrificial offering, you know, it will be accepted. Um, it's something that, um, you know, we cannot disqualify ourselves uh, from this. So, yeah, we just need to, to be, to, to have that encouragement. You know, whatever we've got to give, you know, God will happily accept it. Um, it's our spiritual worship, uh, it says uh, in the ESV version. Um, and, and this has been obviously been translated in, in different, um, different ways uh, for a different version of the Bible. So yeah, it could be spiritual worship, also translated as true and proper worship, and also translated as reasonable service. And... So again, we've got these kind of two sides, really, this kind of spiritual aspect of, of worship, and then we've got this kind of practical element of service. And, and again, for, for me, the, the two things are, are the same. You know, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. They are both you know, good um, translations for what a living sacrifice is all about. I've also read commentators that make a good case for the word to be linked to being rational, to be logical, to be in possession of reason. And, um, and yeah, that, that kind of speaks to me personally uh, as this kind of being a living sacrifice, to be rational. <laughs> what I mean by that is that you know, if, we, if we understand, if we grasp what Paul has said in chapters 1 to 11, if we grasp that gospel and what God has done for us, then it is absolutely rational to, to live for him. You know, we might think that we are, um, sometimes as Christians, we like to think ourselves as being radical. You know, we're living differently to the world. Uh, and, you know, this is quite, you know, quite a strange thing to do, perhaps. But, you know, really, say living for God, I mean, that is a totally rational, totally logical thing to do. Did you know that a Rubik's Cube has 43 quintillion, that's 18 zeros, uh, according to Wikipedia, combinations of where every single colour can be um, on that. So you've got basically 43 quintillion ways that you can have it all iggledy piggledy, and there's, there's one solution where each colour is on its own side. And for me, that, that's, that's logical. You know, if, if you give someone um, a Rubik's Cube, never seen one before, okay, they might not get it straight away, but when you show them that, you go, ah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, we know what to do. We know kind of what we're, what we're aiming for here um, with, with living for God. It's obvious what to do. It is totally rational. Therefore, um, worshipping idols is irrational, isn't it? Um, in Richard's message last week, we heard about uh, Saul, uh, the leader of the army, 
had very clear instructions from Samuel. Uh, Samuel obviously got them from God. Um, as to what to do, you know, Saul, leader of the army, um, what, are, what are my tasks, what are my jobs? Um, Samuel said, right, this, this, and this. And Samuel, you know, he did some of that, you know, you could argue he did mostly did it. Um, and, but yeah, when, when, when Saul was kind of confronted about this, he didn't really seem to understand the problem, didn't kind of seem to get it. And the same can be said about worshipping idols. In Exodus uh, 32, we have this story uh, where yeah, Moses is delayed coming down from the mountain. Uh, so the people say to Aaron, we, we want something else to worship. So Aaron says, well, yeah, give, give me a gold. Uh, and he makes this golden calf. And uh, yeah, it's... But looking, reading it back in, in the Bible, you go, this is ridiculous. Why are we doing that? What, what does Isaiah think about idol, worshipping of idols? Well, here are some of Isaiah's words of wisdom, or, or maybe they're words of exasperation about this topic. Um, Isaiah chapter 44, um, verses 10 and 19. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? Yeah, you can kind of—I I think you can kind of tell by by the text. You know, his kind of tone of voice is like, you know, this is this is stupid, and it is as well, isn't it? But you know, we we, we can we can we can recognise that that uh, worshiping a, a physical idols is foolish. But if we're all honest, you know, we, we've all been um, in Saul's position. We've all kind of thought, well, I uh, know that's what God said, but yeah, I can, I can kind of do it a little bit my way. Surely that, that'll still be okay. And yeah, if we're honest, you know, we, we've all uh, been tempted to, to worship idols that are more subtle in life, I guess. Anything that is putting something else before God um, is that same aspect of, of worshipping idols. Um, so yeah, th this idea of, of worship or service, it's a mixture of the two. It's not just spiritual, it's not just practical. You know, God wants a relationship with us, and uh, yeah, that, that's an amazing offer, and it would be irrational to turn that down. Um, and this, this is what, that, what Paul is, is saying, you know, this is his expl explanation of how we are to become uh, living sacrifices. Um, there's no real set rules to it. The transformation of our mind is an ongoing thing, and that relates to uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, will help us to di di to discern the will of God, along with the Bible, of course, and following Jesus' example uh, through through prayer, through walking with God, through experience. We can discern how to please God. But it's not about burnt offerings anymore. And yeah, th this sacrifice is a, is a daily thing. It reflects the fact that sacrifice is a heart issue. You know, if we get the, get the heart right, as I say, it, it's only logical that we'd want to, to live that out every day. We, God is worthy and um, God works all things for our good, so we can trust him when it comes to sacrifice. Ephesians 5, verses 1 to 2, says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So you can see, you know, why this, this kind of these verses link with what I've already been saying. It's saying, you know, to, to be a living sacrifice, we are to to walk in love and follow Jesus' example, and be a fragrant uh, offering and sacrifice to God. So yeah, fragrance. I thought about a, a perfume shop. You know, there's lots and lots of choice, isn't there? There's lots of 
little bottles of um, different coloured uh, liquids out there. And um, whether you think they smell nice or not is uh, a matter of opinion. But I think you'll agree that the majority of those perfumes are somewhere on the scale between, yeah, quite nice and, you know, wow, that's lovely. So, yeah, they're all, they're all, they're all kind of good, but say, on a, kind of a, a scale. And say it's a personal thing. There are a load of different ways which we can be a fragrant offering to God. We need to have our heart right, uh, and this will be able to give us the desire to be a living sacrifice. You know, talking to God, reading the Bible, worship, drawing close to the Holy Spirit will help us discern the Word of God and then to do it, to sacrifice our time, to sacrifice our energy, uh, financial, spiritual sacrifices, um, emotional sacrifices to God. Um, it will be pleasing to him. So my declaration for today is um, kind of a, a kind of rephrasing of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Uh, it says this on the screen, I am walking daily in my love of Jesus who gave himself for me. And uh, yeah, I hope that you, you can join me uh, in saying that together. Um, I don't know whether there's people watching that are kind of kind of questioning themselves, like, you know, am I walking daily in uh, love of Jesus? You know, and that, that's something absolutely that, that we, can re we can reflect on. Um, that's something that, that, that is, you know, a challenge to us. But I do want to encourage you that, like I say, this, this kind of transforming our mind, you know, it is an ongoing process. So, you know, if, if what you're sacrificing to God uh, today seems quite small, then, you know, say God will still, you know, really uh, accept uh, and love that sacrifice. But this renewing of our mind and discerning the will of God is, a, is an ongoing thing. So, yeah, we can always, um, we can always look to, to, to sacrifice more uh, and to, to, to relate to God in a deeper way. So, yeah, just wherever you are, uh, if you want to stand, um, you know, just, I think it just helps to kind of focus, um, focus in on, on what we're saying. Let's say this together. Three, two, one. I am walking daily in my love of Jesus, who gave himself for me. Every one more time. I am walking daily in my love of Jesus, who gave himself for me. I guess I just want to encourage us to, to talk more about our sacrificial lifestyle. Um, I think that as, you know, as English, uh, being in kind of in the English culture, you know, this, this, this idea of, of not boasting, you know, this is something that, you know, we're, we're very, very conscious of, you know, we don't, don't like boasting um, in our kind of English culture. But, you know, this isn't, this isn't boasting uh, to, to tell people about, you know, what, what you've sacrificed for God and what kind of effect that's had uh, on your life and of other people. Um, so, yeah, I just want to just encourage you to, to kind of speak that out because I think it encourages other people uh, and often you know, it, it gives us ideas, you know, it inspires others to either do the same or to, to kind of get, get before God and, and figure out you know, what it is that, that, uh, that, that they can sacrifice uh, for God. So, I just want to finish by, by praying for us. Yeah, Father, I just pray for our heart attitudes, Lord. I just pray that you would, you would help us to, to grasp hold of that gospel, Lord, um, what you've done for us, you know, our, our state, our state of sin and, you know, that, the weight of that. And then, of course, the, 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 the transformation that, that we take when we put our faith in Jesus and that sin is removed. You know, that, that, that should give us that, that joy every day, Father. Um, and it should um, inspire us to, to live for you, Lord. It is only 
rational to, to live for you. I pray for the, the Holy Spirit's help you know, to dis, for discernment in our own lives, for the will of God for us. You know, God wants to know us each individually, and, and so you know, the Holy Spirit will be revealing you know, individual things uh, for us. Uh, I pray for, for faith and obedience in God's in, instruction. You know, sometimes we're, we're going to get those, those messages from God. You know, we discern the will of God, and then we, we just need some boldness to, to carry that out. Um, I pray for, for eyes to, to see the benefits of our sacrifices, Lord. Yeah, I just pray that, that we would see you know, this, this idea of, say, planting, planting the seed, Lord, that we sacrifice something. And I just pray that, yeah, we, we, can, we can kind of see that coming back around, Lord. We can see how you have transformed it. We can see um, how that has given you glory. We can see how that's helped uh, other people, Father. We can see, um, you know, when, when it's helped ourselves, you know, when we've learned something through it, Lord. Yeah, I just pray that that would be, you know, a, an encouragement to us, uh, an ever-increasing in faith, that when we see those sacrifices at work, Lord. Yeah. Amen.